This wasn't intentional, but I finished recording this game on the 8th of September, which means that the day afterwards was the original release date of the game and the Dreamcast in general. So I got my grind set on like a madman. I edited this whole thing uh, in one day because I wanted it to have the same date as the original release date of this game. And also, since the Dreamcast turns 25, Sega is doing a whole bunch of promotional stuff. They have a trading card uh, set themed after the Dreamcast. They have some really nice looking cards. They have Sonic, they have uh, Crazy Taxi, Shenmue, Choo Choo Rocket, Space Channel 5. I really want this Skies of Arcadia one here. That would be amazing. And also all this merchandise. I really want this stuff, but I'm not going to get it. I'm not getting it. In the early to mid-90s, while the Sega Genesis was making the rounds, Sonic was Sega's hot ticket item, their cash cow. But after Sonic 3 and Knuckles, the next mainline game wouldn't be released until four years later. What is this gap in their resume? This was a time of uncertainty for sure. With the upcoming Sega Saturn and 3D video games becoming the new shiny concept in the industry, eyes were on the big pre-established mascots like Mario and Sonic to release their brand new 3D games. Sonic Team had tampered with the idea as early as Sonic 2, Sonic CD, and Sonic 3 with their special stages, but a fully 3D game was yet to be seen. 1996 comes and goes with nothing for Sonic to show other than Sonic 3D Blast, but there were plans to release Sonic Extreme, which would have been Sonic's first 3D mainline platformer, but that's a whole different story. Quick overview, this game was created and cancelled because of development issues, with nothing other than promo videos and the soundtrack being released to the public. Stop me if you've heard this before, but Sonic kinda had a rough transition to 3D. 1997, Sonic was hurting for a 3D game. Even Mario at this point had revolutionized the industry with his first 3D game. All Sonic got over here was Sonic R, a racing game, and Sonic Fighters. Both in 3D, yes, but neither of them what people want. Sonic Jam also released this year. It was a compilation of the Genesis Sonic games on one Sega Saturn disc, complete with a little hub world to run around in where you could explore, visit galleries, and do menial tasks to burn time. It was the closest the public got to a 3D Sonic game. Pitiful. I'm just kidding, I love Sonic Jam. In late November 1998, Sega released their newest console to the Japanese market, the Sega Dreamcast, my favorite video game console of all time. And one month later in December, Sonic Adventure released, Sonic's long-awaited 3D debut. This game was directed under a new face for mainline Sonic, Takashi Izuka. Sonic Adventure was going to be an RPG when early in development, which may explain the game's emphasis on story compared to the previous titles, but those plans obviously fell through. With an emphasis on jungles and ruins, the team once again went on a trip to various places in South America, taking pictures along the way. Eventually, we Americans got the Dreamcast, as well as Sonic Adventure as a launch title on 9999. Not only was it the best-selling Dreamcast game, but with its boundless scope at the time and its Orca-induced trailers, it's also up there among the best-selling GameCube titles among Nintendo's first-party games, with its later re-release in 2003. Sonic Adventure has become quite the contentious title, however, being discussed to this day whether or not the game is genuinely a quality title, or if it's the first misstep that the Sonic series took leading to a downward spiral ever since. This game and its sequel are some of the most discussed games in the whole series to this day, and I feel as if people in the chronically online Sonic community are too black and white about this topic. It's either the best game ever, or it's trash, and I feel as if not enough attention is given to the small details. For this review, I will be playing the Dreamcast original. I have this amazing converter that takes advantage of the Dreamcast VGA ability and outputs in HDMI. I love the Dreamcast so much, let's just get into this. I'm very excited. Some thousands of years ago, there was an ancient tribe of echidnas. They were very philosophical and wise with words and all that. The chief of said tribe, named Paka Kamek, had a daughter who would wander from the tribal grounds and go explore. Her name was Tikal, and she eventually discovered a shrine holding the Master Emerald and the Seven Chaos Emeralds. Among them at the altar lived a race of Chow, these lovable little creatures that hijacked the series for the next few years. On top of all this, a mystical god creature made of water named Chaos was the protector of both the shrine and these Chow. Tikal, over time, became very close with the Chow and Chaos. Eventually, her father Pak Kamek caught wind of this and attempted to take control of the emeralds to have more power expand his tribe. It's never explicitly stated why he wanted it. Either way, he and his men stormed the altar to seize the emeralds. His attempts to get the emerald failed, and Chaos, to protect the Chow on the altar, in a fit of rage, wiped out the Echidna tribe, with the exception of Tikal, who, after seeing the state that Chaos was in, sealed herself and Chaos inside the Master Emerald using some sort of magic holy words that her grandmother taught to her. And the shrine along with the Master Emerald have now become the basis for Angel Island, or the Floating Island. Let's fast forward to modern day 1998. In the city of Station's Square, Sonic the Hedgehog is living his best life, jumping from rooftops saying things like, Oh yeah! 
This is happening! He strings behind a police chase to find a mysterious monster made of water. After defeat, Chaos retreats to the sewers. The next day, while relaxing at a hotel pool, Tails crashes his new plane that uses the Chaos Emerald as a power source. The two reunite and exchange pleasantries that kind of make it seem like the crew have been split up for a while. The way that Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and Amy all interact, how long has it been since the previous game? Anyways, the two head to Tails' workshop where they come across Dr. Robonic, who Sonic decides to nickname as Eggman, which is what I'll be referring to Robonic as from now on. While I do prefer the name Robotnik to Eggman, I don't mind calling him one over the other. Eggman reveals that he has a new creature under his control named Chaos. He learned of this creature from ancient stone tablets and shattered the Master Emerald, causing Chaos, Anti-Call, to be released. Eggman plans on gathering all the seven Chaos Emeralds so that Chaos can become a god, destroy Station Square, probably rule the world, villain stuff, let's move on. So it's a race. Sonic and Tails travel to get their hands on the Chaos Emeralds before Eggman can. Standard video game stuff. Knuckles, on the other hand, after the Master Emerald shatters, witnesses as Angel Island once again falls, this time into a massive Land. Hope nobody died. He makes it his duty to hunt down the pieces of the Master Emerald and bring his island high up into the sky and maybe get some vendetta on the culprits. Amy, making her return from Sonic CD, is drawn into the conflict when she finds a bird that escapes from Eggman's base. Along with constantly being chased by this robot here, she swears to protect the bird and help it find its family. Speaking of this bird's family, Dr. Eggman creates a series of robots named after letters of the Greek alphabet for some reason, and one in particular, named Gamma, struggles being under Eggman's influence and eventually gains free will after befriending Amy. Gamma then sets out to rescue his brethren from Eggman's grasp. This guy right here is Big the Cat probably the most infamous character in the entire franchise. His pet frog ingests a piece of chaos as well as one of the emeralds, and a wild goose chase ensues as Big tries to get his frog back and go home. Most of these characters' stories lead to a climax aboard the Egg Carrier, the new flying fortress of Dr. Eggman. After a confrontation of everyone against Eggman and Chaos, who now has the power of six emeralds, the Egg Carrier is destroyed and crashes into the ocean. I say that most characters' stories climax here, because it's at this point that Gamma's story just begins. After escaping the destruction, he goes on a spree of hunting down the other Greek lettered robots and destroying them to free the animal inside. And when it's all over, he explodes. Huzzah! See, throughout each character's stories, Tikal will appear as a glowing orb of light and transport them to a flashback of the ancient Echidna tribe to expose them as well as the player, to what happened in the past that led to chaos running amok and turning evil in the first place. After the egg carrier crashes into the ocean, everyone goes their separate ways. Once back on the ground, Sonic chases Eggman down to his base in the jungle for a final confrontation and successfully puts an end to his plans. For now, at least. Tails, learning to be independent, saves Station Square from a missile that Eggman launched as a last-ditch effort. Knuckles, after taking the Chaos Emeralds and Master Emerald Shards from the Egg Carrier, just kinda goes home. Amy finds the bird's family at long last, and Big also just goes home after he gets his pet frog. Although the Egg Carrier was destroyed with Chaos on it, Chaos managed to survive. After swiping all seven Chaos Emeralds in a desperate attempt to regain its power, Chaos becomes Perfect Chaos, the same creature that destroyed the Echidna tribe thousands of years ago and completely wipes out Station Square. In typical shonen fashion, Sonic harnesses the positive power of the Chaos Emeralds, transforming into Super Sonic, letting him run faster and jump higher. Shoes guaranteed to make a kid run faster and jump higher. PF Flyers. And he puts an end to Chaos's havoc. Tikal thanks the heroes for their efforts and finally goes to the heavens with chaos, never to be seen again. With Sonic running into the distance, not stopping for a second, rock music playing in the background, I love, love, love Sonic. Oh my gosh, he's so cool. Wow. Can I get a round of applause? Yeah, it's only the first 3D Sonic game, and the plot is taking up a whole two pages of my script. If you're wondering why this story summary may have been kinda intertwined within itself, or all over the place, that's because the story is told through the eyes of six different playable campaigns that, on their own, tell a tale well enough. When taken as a whole large story, it leads to some confusion and a lot of redundancy. It's not a bad idea at all, it's a cool concept, everyone has their own story, it's almost like an episode of a sitcom. Have any of you ever seen Hoodwinked? Or Knives Out? It's a similar idea. I can see what they were going for, but it just wasn't executed very well in my opinion. I do find the story to be very entertaining though. This game started the trend of Sonic dealing with a bunch of mythical beasts and ancient gods. This also started the trend of Sonic games taking their plots extremely seriously. I love the themes of ancient ruins, jungles, and mythical things. It signifies so much of what makes this game, and the Dreamcast itself, so cool to me. The story of this game was also adapted multiple times into other forms of media, so as a Sonic fan who grew up primarily with 2000 Sonic content, I got very 
very used to and comfortable with this plot, having experienced it in so many different forms. But nostalgia aside, the story can be hard to get invested in for newcomers. It's very repetitive. You play as six separate characters, and with all six of them on the egg carrier as it goes down, you have to watch a very similar scene go down again and again and again. The inclusion of Amy, Gamma, and Big are often questioned due to how little they bring to the story in terms of narrative. They aren't really justified in being here, since they don't really contribute. While Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles are all dealing with important matters, Amy is off to find a bird, Big is trying to find his frog, and Gamma is on the crashed remains of the egg carrier destroying his mechs. There's no doubt that it can still be enjoyed, but the inclusion of these three can definitely lead to me scratching my head. Not to mention that the cutscenes where this game tells its story are not presented well in the slightest. I'm not talking about graphical fidelity at all here, but cutscenes can be brutal to sit through. Characters all have default standing animations that look incredibly awkward. Dialogue is stilted, slow, and very uninteresting. They are paced horribly. There's no way you haven't seen any clips of the characters talking in this game. Whoa! A chaos emerald. Not to mention that you can't even skip cutscenes in the Dreamcast version of this game, absolutely slaughtering any replayability that this game had. But to be completely fair here, this game was released in 1999, 1998 for the Japanese audience, and only a month or two after Metal Gear Solid, which was pretty much the first video game to take cutscene presentation and voice acting seriously. A lot of people seem to forget that this game is from the late 90s, probably due to the fact that most people played it in the 2000s on their GameCube, alongside games with much better production quality like Resident Evil 4, Ratchet & Clank, and once again, the Metal Gear Solid franchise. But biases are biases. These cutscenes are very dated and hard to get through for a modern audience. Sonic Adventure's story takes place over the course of a pretty short amount of time, I think it's like two days. But you replay it in the perspective of six different characters, all of which bring a new style of gameplay to the table. I pondered a bit on how I should tackle it for this review, but I came to the somewhat obvious conclusion that the best way to go about this was to review each character individually and go through their strengths and weaknesses one at a time. Let me start off with a question, however. What makes a Sonic game a Sonic game? To me, personally, and to a lot of others most likely, a Sonic game is a platformer which has some sort of focal point around speed and getting to the end of a stage. And it's no secret that starting with this game, the developers behind Sonic began to struggle with keeping this at the forefront. Starting here, we begin to see the appearance of gameplay that isn't Sonic the Hedgehog in any way. And these, fairly often, are what determines a good Sonic game from a bad one. The story may not be up to snuff, but the world and tools that you have at your disposal certainly are. For the first time in the series, we have hub worlds to mess around in. The city of Station Square, as well as the Mystic Ruins. In the hub worlds, you'll find Tikal as an orb of light. If you touch it, she'll give you hints on what to do or where to go, eliminating any risk of getting lost or stuck. These two areas are what link the whole game together, and they're surprisingly intact in terms of the world that this game creates. I don't think that many people realize that this mountainside is actually Angel Island, or that this bell tower is actually connected to the other side in Station Square. There are loads of humans around to talk to, that give the world a lot of life. This girl and her mom spend the game waiting for her dad to return home. I'm sorry, little girl. Your dad's not coming home. This woman has a crush on the burger shop employee, and the farther into the game you get, the closer she gets to him, and the more disturbed the man gets. The reason the trains are down for a good chunk of the story is due to a worker strike, and then there's this guy, who you see hanging out with two separate women throughout the game, until he eventually gets caught and a confrontation happens at the pool. A lot of effort went into these random people that most people won't even pay any mind to. But there's more to the hub worlds than catching a guy cheating on his girlfriends. These are areas between stages that allow you not only to explore for items and such, but also test out your abilities and to get a feel for the controls. And speaking of controls, I completely stand by what I say here, and I'm not exaggerating in the slightest when I say that Sonic Adventure has the best control of any Sonic game, 2D or 3D, from 1991 to this day, nothing has topped Sonic Adventure's feel of control and physics. The way that Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles move is ethereal. Not only do they have wonderful animations that convey their movements very smoothly and satisfyingly, but they are very responsive to button presses and analog stick movements. Gems feel just the right amount of floaty. It's not too heavy, yet it also doesn't give you too much air to the point where nothing is a challenge. Sonic's spin dash has a whole button dedicated to it, and it alone. The instant you press X, Sonic immediately begins to charge up, and you can let go at any time to get a burst of speed. This means you can just spam the button to blast at lightning speed. It's very powerful, and a spin dash with a well-timed jump can have you soaring into the air. It's a rather unwieldy step up from a normal jump that definitely takes skill to master. I'm not joking when I say that this game is worth playing for the controls alone. This game in general takes skill to master, not because the stages themselves are particularly difficult, but because this game is one step away from crumbling beneath your feet. No, this game is not the most stable in the world. Nothing that stops you from making progress, but things will disrupt you. 
Stages are at their best when they have a large open space, and are at their worst when they have small and thin pathways and platforms, which unfortunately is the majority of stages in this game. The camera is pretty bad too. It's a product of its time, and for 1998 it could be considered a pretty dynamic and polished camera, but it will get caught on stuff and occasionally just not give you a good angle. Part of getting good at this game is knowing how to work around stuff like this. Luckily, with this amazing game feel, that shouldn't be too hard. There's a reason Spin Dash Jump is a legitimate term in the Sonic community. Sonic has the largest campaign, going through 10 stages, and it genuinely feels like the developers made an attempt at a Genesis game in 3D. Stages are large and sprawling, usually with multiple pathways to traverse and secrets to discover. There's a lot of speed, spectacle, as well as substance, and a lot of incentive to get better and better at stages you've already played, which is what drew me to the classic games. For Sonic, all you need to do to finish a stage is to get to the end, no strings attached, which I think is the perfect way to go about it. It leaves the casual crowd satisfied on the first run, and hardcore fans satisfied with trying to get better and better, and that's exactly what I did as a kid for 60 hours. Next up is Tails. Aside from having an adorable character model, Tails' special ability is his signature flight. This time it's much more utilized, with his stages having lots of opportunities for flight-related shortcuts, and these rings in the air that give you a speed boost. Tails is present for most of Sonic's story, and because of that they have a lot of the same stages. Overall, I think that Tails' campaign, while not as good as Sonic's, is a step up from the classic games, having stages that take real advantage of his flight. His stages still require you to get to the end, and in his case, he's always racing someone to the finish line, and overall, I think his transition to 3D was great. Hang on, I need to throw up. Knuckles, searching for the shards of the Master Emerald, is placed in sandbox-like areas and must find three pieces of the emerald to finish the given stage. Because of this, Knuckles' stages aren't built like Tails or Sonic's. You can make it from one end of the stage to the other very quickly, as Knuckles is just as fast and nimble as he was before. He can run, glide, and climb walls. But it's all about the hunt here, which you do with these radars on the bottom of the screen essentially acting as a game of hot and cold. The color gets warmer and the beeping gets more rapid the closer you get to one of the emerald pieces. The emeralds can be hidden in enemies, underground, or just out in the open. If you still cannot find one, you can use T-Call for assistance, as she'll fly in the direction of the emerald piece, which is a great method of providing hints, and is something I'm going to be stuck up on in later games. Knuckles' stages are pretty controversial, but I stand by this game's interpretation of Knuckles. His levels are small and fast-paced, and it can be very satisfying to complete. The main trio here, Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles, made the transition quite well in my opinion, but now let's get into the ones that most people disagree with. E102 Gamma's gameplay has you get to the end of the stage like normal, but you have to get there under a time limit, which you can extend by destroying enemies. Due to the story beats that Gamma goes through, there's an underlying sense of eeriness that lingers throughout most of his campaign. It's pretty cool. Gamma shoots enemies with his gun, and overall is just not as fast as Sonic or Tails. By targeting multiple enemies at once, you can get more points and time added. Truth be told, Gamma's gameplay can be very fun, but the biggest issues that I have with Gamma's campaign is that it takes forever for it to get going, being front-loaded with loads of cutscenes, which, may I remind you, are unskippable in the Dreamcast version of this game. And it's incredibly easy. You run through these stages designed for fast characters, but not only are you nowhere near as fast, leading to being able to see obstacles and enemies miles ahead, but you blow up anything even remotely within your range. The bosses aren't any better. You can beat most of them by mashing the X button, the exception being Beta, the final boss for Gamma's campaign, which is also the hardest boss in the game bar none. Let's do Amy next. Okay, complete objectivity here. Amy is very slow. Walking in a straight line feels fine enough, but the second you make a turn, it feels like you're dragging bricks tied to your ankles. If you play as Amy immediately after Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles, which is what most people do, it is going to be rough to adjust. Amy probably has it the worst with cutscenes. She has the least amount of stages out of anyone, but her campaign still clocks in at over an hour due to the cutscenes. I legitimately got up to leave the room one time and came back five minutes later to a cutscene still playing, and when it finished, I had to walk to the next cutscene. Amy's gameplay consists of running away from a robot named Zero. If he catches you, you die, which leads to some very clever and nerve-wracking levels and concepts. She can hit things with her hammer, do a somersault at top speed, which unless you're climbing upstairs is not going to be very often. But truth be told, I love Amy's gameplay. Objectively, I can look at it and acknowledge that it's not very Sonic, but it's so satisfying to constantly be hunted by a robot and traverse through a very standard platformer-esque stage. Solving puzzles and making a getaway? A whole game based on this concept would be awesome, as long as it's done right. Lastly, is Big the Cat. Right out of the gate, I'm going to say that I love the character of Big the Cat the big comic relief oaf. Especially after reading the comics, Big the Cat is great, but Big here is probably the campaign that people most remember from this game. Yes, even more than Sonic. Why is that? Well, let's get into it. Big lost his frog, who ran away, so how does he get his Hollywood help back? He approaches the water containing Froggy, he casts his fishing line, and he fishes for him. Yes, like with a rod and hook. 
Don't tell him. To avoid being redundant, since everybody else and their grandmother has already talked about why Big's gameplay sucks, I'll gloss over it. Not only is fishing the last thing that I want to do in a product that is being sold to me as part of the Sonic the Hedgehog series, but it's also very unclear and not explained at all how to approach the gameplay to begin with. If you were to look up Big the Cat, you'd most likely find videos on YouTube of people trying and failing to catch Froggy, getting very angry and upset and sad. Just get him! <laughs> Oh, yeah! Oh my god. This is agony. <laughs> When you cast your lure, it has to be a certain distance away from you, otherwise, it won't work. Nothing tells you about that. If you want to move the lure, you have to mash the opposite direction that you want it to go. It can move left and right. Nothing tells you about that. Once Froggy catches onto your lure, you have to quickly flick the stick to ensure that you get a hit on the screen. Nothing in the game tells you about that. Do you see the problem? I know about these, but the average first time player will not. Sure, I can be big story in like 20 minutes now, but as a kid, you can bet that it took me hours. Another minor hiccup that I think is a problem with this game is that Tikal interrupts your progress at seemingly random times to give the characters exposition. It can break the pace and make you watch a lot of cutscenes, sometimes minutes worth. I really wish that Tikal and the flashbacks were handled more seamlessly than they were here. It would have helped with the pacing of the game for sure. I think the stages are pretty good though. There are 11 in total. Emerald Hill was the commercial stage. The beautiful hotel beach resort, complete with forests, caves, and the scene with the orca that sold the Dreamcast. Lots of secrets to find and always fun to revisit. Windy Valley is not nearly as good. Aesthetically, it's amazing with floating islands, towers, old structures, and windmills floating in the air. I like the first section of the stage, but once you get sucked into the tornado, it all goes downhill. Getting out of the tornado is tedious and awkward, and the final third of the stage is almost exclusively long, thin stretches of road where I can't help but bump into the walls and lose my speed. Open spaces, man, open spaces. Xenopolis is very fun. Its gimmick is that you need to get as many rings as you can and deposit them into a safe to make a money pile large enough to climb to the end of the stage. You get rings by playing pinball, complete with a very in-your-face crossover with Knights into Dreams. It's very trippy. Ice Cap is probably the worst level in the game for me. It looks nice in the Dreamcast version with its white and blue color palette, but the stage just consists of intricately climbing up the giant room. At least the snowboard sequence is pretty fun. Twinkle Park is great. It's like an intergalactic theme park. The skybox is really cool here. The level has lots of nods to carnivals and the like. The bumper car track is really fun, and I love the castle. Speed Highway is the best stage in the game, for sure. It's a thrill ride from beginning to end. There's lots of speed and tons of spectacle. The loops are satisfying. I like when Sonic runs down this building and it's all dramatic. And the third section of this level when you're in the city and at dawn is playing, it's the best part of the game. And look! It's the place. Simmy, simmy, yeah, simmy, yeah, simmy, oh. Drakes. Oh, la, la. Red Mountain is good also, with its focus on lava and being underground. There are prison inmates down here. What's gonna happen to them? Sky Deck is a mess. There are tiny platforms everywhere, and lots of scripted segments that just don't trigger half the time, causing you to have to awkwardly maneuver around them manually. Early 3D clunk at its finest. Final Egg is a lot of fun. Lots of opportunities for floaty jumps and speed. Hot Shelter is the only stage that Sonic doesn't traverse, just Amy, Gamma, and Big the Cat. It's very slow paced and platform heavy. Many puzzles, mechanics to deal with, and split pathways. I like it a lot. I completely forgot to talk about Lost World, and despite doing so, it's my second favorite level in the game. You know, I love the ruins, I love the theming and the music, it's just a whole lot of fun. I especially love using the spin dash to skip a whole chunk of the level. Throughout each campaign you'll find upgrades which give a character a new ability. Sonic gets the light speed dash, which lets him fly across a trail of rings after charging up. Tails gets the rhythm badge, letting him twirl around and continuously attack with his tails. Knuckles gets digging claws, allowing him to find emeralds that are hidden underground. To execute it though, you have to press the jump and action buttons at the same time. Also, he gets the fighting gloves, which I never get because they're gross and yellow. So here's some footage online. Amy gets a feather that lets her spin her hammer around. I never use it. Big gets a flotation device, as well as lower upgrades that I swear don't really work. And Gamma gets a booster that allows him to hover. You get it, like, immediately. So I don't understand why it wasn't just a part of his initial moveset, but whatever. So the game obviously isn't soaring with flying colors in terms of design. Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles are relatively consistent in their quality. Amy is seen as boring and repetitive by the majority of fans. Gamma is also pretty contentious, and Big's campaign is unanimously disliked. In my opinion, I think it would be best to play the campaigns in an unconventional order. Most people that I know who have played Sonic Adventure go in the order that the game lists the campaigns. That being Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, Amy, Gamma, and Big. But there's nothing stopping you from doing them in any order you want after you unlock them. For this review, I played Sonic's, then Big's, then Tails, then Gamma's, followed by Amy, and lastly Knuckles. This honestly did leave me feeling as if the experience was just more consistent overall, rather than the quality of the game getting worse and worse as it goes. That's just something that I found though. There are also some mini-games throughout. Amy has a game of whack-a-mole required to progress, 
But both Sonic and Tails have to deal with this substage where you chase the egg carrier on the tornado, Tails' plane. You crash land the first time, so you have to do it twice. But since this happens in both Sonic and Tails' campaign, you have to play both of these boring auto-scrollers twice. Please, just have a little bit of mercy, Sonic Team. This game has a really cool Sonic Team logo. I've dabbled a bit in bosses, but I'll go more in depth now. Most bosses will take place either against Eggman or Chaos. These mostly consist of playing the waiting game, waiting for them to reveal their weakness, hit them once, and then repeat until they're dead. This is like the worst kind of boss to give a hyper-caffeinated blue pincushion like Sonic. These bosses are slow, predictable, and boring. Bosses will occasionally occur against one of our other heroes. These are even worse. The most pitiful bosses I've ever encountered in a video game, and I don't even think I'm joking. Sonic will go up against Chaos and Eggman multiple times, but nowhere near as frequently as he did in the classic games, Tails as well, but also Knuckles. Because all three of these characters were at the scene to witness Chaos transforming into Chaos 4, all three of them have to fight this. Dreadful boss fight. Amy's only boss fight is against Zero, the robot that chases her throughout her story. It's a really fun boss, as you have to hit him into these electrical barriers, and he's always drawn towards you during his jumping attack. It's a very interactive and well-designed boss. Gamma's bosses are, once again, pitiful, other than his final fight against Beta, who is the best boss in the game. When you shoot at him, he will launch missiles at you and charge at you at the same time. You must destroy the missiles and also hit him before his charge animation ends. Very engaging. Bravo, Sonic Adventure. You did it. Lastly, I want to bring up the Chow Garden. According to Deep Sonic, Sonic lore, Chow can only live in very specific and very clean environments, and when you go to one of these places, you can care for a Chow. Apparently one of these is inside of a hotel, whatever. Feed them, pet them, train them, and race them to win awards. That's all I'll say on them for now. I plan on going much more in depth with the Chow Garden later. Something that you can win from racing your Chow, though, is emblems. Emblems are collectibles that you obtain throughout the game. You get them by beating a stage, as well as any other challenges contained within the stage. It's not very innovative. For getting all emblems in the game, your reward is nothing! In the Dreamcast version, at least. In the DX re-release, you get Metal Sonic. Pretty cool, I guess. Not worth it, though. How have I gotten this far without mentioning the music? Sonic is no longer a Genesis side-scroller, and their decision on where to go with the music is possibly the most impactful part of this game. I'm not even joking. Sonic, within the gaming community, has become famous for having some of the cheesiest yet also unironically badass rock music in the entire scene. And that got its start here. Open Your Heart is wonderful, it makes the final boss against Chaos so climactic. Each character has their own theme. Sonic has a rock song, Tails has a much softer rock song, Tails has a very corny rap theme, Amy has a very creepy stalkery jazz pop song, and Gamma's piano solo is just amazing. The sheer variety of this game's soundtrack is so unreal. So many different genres and vibes. There's cheery park themes, intense beats, mysterious themes representing ancient entities, headbanging evil bases, cities at dawn, that's my favorite song in the soundtrack. Sonic Adventure's soundtrack works even without the game. Just go listen to it right now. It's my favorite soundtrack in the entire series, and it has been for many years now. Let's talk about graphics. I think that visually, this game has aged very well for its time. Again, remember, this game released in 1998. This game is unreal in this regard. So while it doesn't hold up as well as something on, say, the GameCube, or the Xbox, or the PS2, it blows other games from 1998 out of the water. Banjo-Kazooie, Ocarina of Time, Crash Bandicoot 3, Sonic Adventure not only trumps these, but has a fantastic sense of personality and detail that other games at this time can only dream of. Seriously, I'd highly recommend going into first person view and just looking at the world from a bunch of different angles. This game can be very detailed and pretty. Character models are true to the characters, and I feel like it's a natural evolution of Sonic and the crew's designs. I adore this game's art style so much. All promotional material for this game has my heart. I love the thick black outlines and almost reflective glowing shading. The colors are so deep and rich, too. They really pop and on paper. And this new art style would stick through the rest of the 90s and the 2000s. And I think that this is where Sonic, visually, was at his best. Just look at the Sonic Adventure logo. It's outlined with some kind of rock, the water ripple in the background, and the gradient inside the letters that starts as a palm tree beach sky and transitions into an ocean. It's so 90s, oh my god, it hurts. This art style just represents Sonic to me and is what I think of when Sonic is mentioned. The Mystic Ruins are also very appealing. There's a very dark brown and green theming to the ruins in the jungle that just feels so remote and mysterious, especially when you drop into the maze-like jungle and the white fog envelops the distance with streams of water passing through. Speaking of water, this game, and many other Dreamcast games, had a very large emphasis on water. Sonic Adventure's main antagonist is made up of water, not to mention all the beaches and pools throughout this game, and I'm fairly certain that this is due to the Sega Saturn, the previous console, really struggling when creating convincing-looking water physics. Water is just hard to animate in general. I'm sure that this was very impressive at the time, but hold on. This probably isn't how you remember the game, is it? No, you probably remember it as something like this. Yeah. 
In 2003, Sonic Adventure was ported to the GameCube, which was then ported to PC, which was then ported to PS3 and Xbox Live, then to Steam. This is by far the most widespread version of the game. Awesome, right? Millions of new people now get to play Sonic's first 3D outing without having to hunt down an old Dreamcast. The only problem being that Sonic Adventure DX Director's Cut is a massive downgrade on the original in almost every way possible in terms of visuals. The lighting. Sonic Adventure had very amazing lighting for the time, which was only possible on the Dreamcast. DX quite literally mangles the lighting, ruining almost all the atmosphere that this game has. You'd be surprised how much lighting can affect the mood of a location or scene. Also, many graphics were outright changed. Things are much more sterile now. Nearly all reflections in the game are gone. The Mystic Ruins are looking much more rocky now, rather than a lush jungle. And I'm sorry, is the train station supposed to look like a hospital? And oh my god, look at this water. It looks like Mountain Dew. You see this strange black and white thing on the floor at the end of the casino sewers? Well, it's supposed to be light shining through a grate. How on earth did they mess this up so badly? The characters all got new models for this port too. A higher poly count leading to much smoother models that honestly look worse than the originals for me. They look like plastic toys, they don't blend in with the world around them very well at all. Seeing such smooth models in this very low poly world in comparison? Here's the thing. I'm not saying that these are both totally different experiences. It's not like if you played DX and didn't like the game as a whole, that you could play the original on Dreamcast and suddenly love it. I think the DX version is a very bad way to play the game, especially if you're aware of all the changes. It may seem like I'm nitpicking, but tiny issues, if enough add up, make a huge problem. And this is not nostalgia bias. I grew up playing Sonic Adventure DX on the GameCube. I have 60 hours in this file alone, but after playing the Dreamcast version once, I can never go back. This also isn't a case of me jumping on a hype train. The opinion that the Dream Dreamcast version looks better than the DX version has become a very popular opinion among fans recently, but I got my Dreamcast and a copy of Sonic Adventure before the public opinion started to shift in favor of the original. To me, this game will look best on an original Dreamcast hooked up to a CRT like I did for this video, but I know that barely anybody has that as an option. So what? Are you just out of luck? Well, let me point you in the direction of the Dreamcast Restoration mod. It's a mod for the Steam version of the game that restores the visuals as close to the Dreamcast version as possible, while still retaining the DX version's 60 FPS and ability to skip cutscenes. This is how you play the game, and to those involved in making this, bravo. Hopefully Sega someday gives you a similar opportunity as they did for Evening Star. Sonic Adventure is a game that I think everyone should at least try. Similar to Mario 64 or Ocarina of Time, this game represents a time in video game history where technology was advancing rapidly. And there was constantly a new cutting-edge game. This game had a lot to prove to the market at the time, and it tried its damnness by showcasing what the Dreamcast was capable of with a ton of variety. And although that variety is the cause of most of this game's problems, I still think that Sonic Adventure successfully brought the series into the third dimension. Although half of this game is very contentious, the other half is praised enough to make it some people's favorite game in the franchise. It's one of mine, with decent level design, fun game mechanics, and once again, gorgeous and euphoric controls. This is a game I'd recommend to anyone interested. While going in though, just be aware of its learning curve, outdated design, and jank.